Hey everyone. So this week I got a really interesting question from um, a friend and colleague and this person asked how do I cope with change fatigue? Um, now for those of you that aren't familiar it's that sense of I guess frustration and the lack of drive that we can bump into when we've been pushing change for a long time in an organization and the other people around us don't get it, things aren't moving fast enough, you know we maybe we've been pushing for a long time and something's not coming through or um, maybe we just feel like it's constant change on top of change on top of change and everything's always fluid and nothing's ever stable. So this idea of change fatigue is a really real thing for those of us that are going to spend a long time um, or a lot of effort and investment in trying to transform our organizations and ourselves at the same time. Um, so I wanted to share today a few things that I do personally. So these are things that I do every day, every week to help keep my energy levels really high, um, to help build my personal resilience and to make sure that I'm avoiding burnout, I'm avoiding that change fatigue, I'm avoiding the chronic stress and the physical symptoms that come from all of that, as well as the mental symptoms and the drop off in performance when you let change fatigue and you let that burnout get the best of you. So the first thing I do is actively make sure that I am building space around the change. So what I mean by that is if I'm doing five days a week in a particular organization or in a particular role, I try and make sure that I'm only focusing on two or three days within that five as being active change type activities. And then the rest of the time, what I try and do is have some stuff that's uh, pretty stable or pretty day to day or, you know, pretty um, low key. And what that does is it helps to anchor into some of those things that stay the same and then some of those things that are actively changing. So it might mean picking my battles on a few different projects. It might mean that I'm actually just helping run a particular part of the organization for a couple of days a week and then we're focusing on actively changing another part of the organization for the other two to three days a week. And that ability to make space is really critical, not just to make space around what's changing and what's not, but actually to start to carve out that space so that, um, you know, bigger picture, as you start to move to different and more strategic type work, um, that ability to carve out space so that you can actually do that work rather than all the noise of the day-to-day -day is really critical as well. So making space is important. And I think it's particularly important because a lot of us will often be in a role where we have our day job and then we have our change the work job um, or we'll have something that's lumped onto us. And so this transformation and this change becomes over and above what we do today. And it's really important that we actually make that change piece part of the work that we do day-to-day but equally making sure that we're not overwhelming ourselves with too much change. So that threshold might be different for other people. Um, and if you're in an active change role five days a week, it might be about making sure that you've got some anchor points outside of your work day that are static, that are pretty, um, you know, they're, they're, they're predictable, they're monotonous, that stuff's not changing. So actively managing the level of change that you're dealing with on a daily and weekly basis, really important and choosing to be strategic about where you're changing and where things might be more stable. So it's the first thing I do. The second thing that really, really helps is I need to work in a way, in a place, in an environment where I can be really passionate about the, either the work that I'm doing, the people that I'm working with, the team that I'm working with, or our collective purpose. So having that passion and getting really excited about what it is you do, who you do it with, what the bigger picture is that you're trying to achieve, that will get you over so many hurdles. So if you don't, if you're not getting up in, in the day and you're not excited about the work that you do, um, whilst that can be a sign of change fatigue, you need to know that at your core, you feel like you're contributing to something that's bigger than yourself and that's making the world a better place. Um, so igniting that passion is really important. The third thing that I do um, and this is for the extroverts out there. Uh, I love talking to people. I love working with people. It's part of why I do what I do. And so one of the really, really important ways for me to re-energize myself and to avoid that burnout and that feeling of the weight 
of the change on my shoulders is I need to talk to other people who get it. So these might be people within the organization that I'm in. There might be other people in my team that get it and we can kind of share war stories and scars and, you know, there's a bit of that cathartic kind of whinging that needs to happen. You just get it off your chest and you move on. That's really important. Um, but also people outside of the organization. So I'm talking maybe other people who do a similar role to what you do. Um, and so you can connect on their understanding of what it is that you're trying to do and the change that you're trying to drive. It might be your mentors or your coaches who are living and breathing this aspirational place that you're looking for, but you can have a conversation with people who get it, people who understand what you're trying to do, people who understand the way that you're trying to do it. There's some empathy around the frustration, but equally you can actually kind of just chill and relax and talk about big picture philosophically what you're trying to do what those work methods are and you can kind of trust some of the answers that are coming back because these people come from a perspective that you value um, and you understand and you know that they get it um, on that level as well so connecting with other people who get it whether they're inside my organization outside the organization or mentors and coaches really really important um, and then probably the, the fourth thing that I wanted to say that's really, really important is your food and exercise. So change fatigue is often a symptom of um, a buildup of the stress hormones in our body. It's often a sign that we've been under stress for an extended period of time. Um, and we're actually pushing into what you could deem as chronic stress from a more uh, medical kind of perspective. So what I mean by that is that you are in an agitated, stressed out state, and it's prolonged for a period of time. Now, within our bodies, we have a number of different stress hormones that will release when we're under pressure. Um, you will probably all be familiar with the adrenal response, which is that get up, go, the, the initial kind of charge. Now, adrenaline is a chemical that our body produces, and it's actually able to be dissolved within the body. The body can break it down. So adrenaline's released as the first spark when we have a stressful event. It's designed to get the legs moving to run from the tiger. <laughs> and the adrenal response is that initial kick. Adrenaline lasts for about an hour within the body before it starts to break down. And if at the end of that hour we are still in a stressful state, the body will go to a stage two stress response where it releases additional stress hormones. It's where the cortisol starts to flow through your system. And so what the body's doing is it realizes that we haven't necessarily escaped that tiger that was chasing us. And we're now bedding in for survival mode and we're getting in for the long haul. And the body will start to activate or shut down various systems based on prolonging your life and survival mode uh, and so it's it, it happens as quickly as as an hour if you've had a stressful day and you've been stressed out all day your body's releasing cortisol into your system so that's what we call a more long-term stress response now the thing about cortisol is that your body won't break it down naturally so whereas the adrenaline sort of dissolves through your bloodstream cortisol has to be actively flushed and here's where the food and exercise bit comes in. The way that you flush that stress hormone out of your system is through various means. Uh, exercise can be a really powerful component of being able to flush that out of your system, um, but also the foods that you choose to eat. And so uh, you'll, if you do a quick Google, you'll find a lot of different lists, but there's probably a couple of things that I noticed. So number one, Dark chocolate is really good for flushing cortisol. Big one for me. That was my first takeaway. Chocolate equals good. Um, but if you've got a if you've got a dark chocolate that's over 70-80% cocoa uh, content, that's going to help to flush that stress hormone out. And the way it does that is it binds to the chemicals and flushes them through your body system. The, um, the other broader um, category of foods that will help you to flush uh, cortisol out of your system are... Um, People talk about bananas and dark leafy greens. What actually is going on there is it's the soluble fiber content that will bind to that cortisol and help push it through your system. Um, and then there's a couple of others around. Um, I like to go for a lot of really antioxidant rich 
foods, so we often think of blueberries when we say the word antioxidants. Um, believe it or not, cloves are another really interesting and quirky, high um, antioxidant rich food. Um, but again, it's going into those spaces of what's going to flush out of your system and then what are the micronutrients, what are all those vitamins and minerals that you can take into your body that's going to power up so that your system is able to pull on all of the chemicals that it needs to operate efficiently. Um, so that fourth piece around food and exercise is a whole rabbit hole in itself. Um, but know that if you are in a, an environment where you are having a prolonged stress response, which means more than an hour, um, and if you're going into you know, a stressful week or a stressful month because you've got a big project coming on, you're hitting that chronic stress response, your body is releasing a lot of cortisol. It has a long half-life, so it doesn't, it's not going to break down in the body and it's not going to dissipate quickly. Um, and you will actually build and accumulate that unless you're actively flushing it out. Worse than that, if you start accumulating it, your body starts to get used to it. Um, and so you, you build this tolerance and it's just a whole kind of nasty cycle that um, if you leave it unchecked, can end up with your chronic, uh, your chronic fatigue type symptoms. So you start to have adrenal fatigue and your body systems actually start to stop operating and stop responding to the chemicals in your body because you've been flooding your system with all of these um, prolonged stress hormones. So you really want to make sure that you nail it in terms of bringing that stress back under control. So giving yourself space, making sure that you're doing things that help to kick you out of that fight or flight mode on a regular basis and then actively flushing with foods that um, let's say high soluble fiber content as your one go-to so your fruits and vegetables um, that are going to flush that out of your system that's really important so chronic um, chronic fatigue want to avoid <laughs> when we're in an environment where we start to feel those symptoms of burnout and change fatigue we know that we're heading down a path and we need to head it off and so making sure that you're making space for activities in your day-to-day -day that are anchoring and solid and kind of day-to-day -day and don't change versus choosing where you make change. Ensuring that you're really passionate about the work that you're doing, the people that you're working with, or the ultimate purpose that you're striving for. Um, having conversations with other people that get it, that are on the same page about the type of work that you're trying to do and the type of transformation that you're trying to bring and supporting your physical body with food and exercise that's going to help keep you um, in a state where your body has all it needs to be um, high performing. Those are the things that I do on a daily and a weekly basis to make sure that I'm functioning at that level that I can continue to build change within the organization. I can continue to be that role model and that leader that people in the organization need so that we can keep progressing forward, even if it's baby steps. Uh, so let me know what you think about all of that. Uh, and before I go, I've actually got a program coming up that's going to be launched in the next couple of weeks that I want, to keep, want you to keep an eye out for. It's all about how you build influence in the people around you so that you can really cement transformation and change in your organization. So I'm going to teach you all of the really super powerful techniques that I use to help change thinking um, and to help build a learning organization and to cement the change long term so that I know that it's going to last long past the time that I might uh, leave an organization or no longer have a part in it. So keep an eye out for that. I'll pop a couple of links down below to some other articles that you might find interesting and also to that new course. And drop me a comment below. Let me know how you go with some of those techniques. I would love to hear from you. Wherever you are in the world this week, I hope you're having a wonderful time and enjoy. Have a great week.